This is Politics and Media 101. I'm Jeff Browning. Aaron Rupar is a journalist, a close observer of the U.S. media ecosystem, and someone who has a lot of insight into how information spreads throughout society and throughout the world. The violence in Ukraine is a reality for people who live there, but for the rest of us around the world, everything we see comes through a filter of time and opinion. It matters who in the media we pay attention to. And on that note, Aaron spends a lot of time monitoring what's said in the media, who's saying it, and whether what they're saying actually stacks up to the truth, to the facts, to the evidence, to what we do know. We talked to him about all of this and more. Like all of our episodes, this is an edited version of a much longer conversation that was taped live with audience questions. For information on how to join us in past episodes, please visit our website, pm101.live. Please also take a second to subscribe on whichever streaming service you're using right now so you don't miss our next episode this Friday featuring Justin Chang, who's a film critic for the LA Times, as well as NPR's Fresh Air. Justin Higgins and John Gunnison led the interview. Without any further ado, let's roll the tape. So you do run the Substack public notice. What type of topics do you write about and what makes it unique in today's political media ecosystem where there are a lot of people and a lot of outlets writing on different topics? Yeah, public notice is my main destination for my writing these days. And I'm mainly covering media and politics with a focus on the American right there. So I try to have a variety of posts, you know, and not be too invested in just kind of like one vein of coverage. But I do a lot of accountability work as it pertains to right wing media, especially Fox News, you know, Tucker Carlson being the most watched host in the country these days. I tend to write a lot about stuff that he's saying, you know, a lot of coverage of Trump world as well. Today, I did a piece on that new FEC filing that American Bridge filed against Trump, basically alleging that he needs to officially declare a presidential campaign at this point because he's violating campaign finance laws by having already made up his mind, but not declaring, um, which allows him more latitude with fundraising and spending than he would have otherwise. And so, you know, I do some coverage of the current administration as well. And so, you know, it's it's kind of it's a publication about politics with a focus on media, I would say. And my background is, you know, as at Vox, I covered Trump and the Trump White House. And so, you know, I still find myself kind of being drawn into that orbit a lot in terms of the the stories that I write, because I try and do explanatory work and, you know, with lots of context, even though I try to keep it somewhat brief, I try not to go much longer than like 1500 words with the newsletter. But I try to bring that sort of explanatory approach to topics pertaining to media and the intersection of media and politics. So, Aaron, you are known for being this sort of ubiquitous and prodigious clipper of television news clips. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got into that kind of work and how you became sort of the go to person that so many people are looking to on the Twitter platform for that kind of material? A lot of the work that I do also is, you know, if there's like a congressional hearing or some sort of political event that I do live coverage of on Twitter with video, sometimes the next day I will do a post kind of unpacking, you know, the main takeaways. I do a lot of that with congressional hearings, high profile ones at least. But to kind of back up, getting into that was really a total accident. My first job in D.C. was with Think Progress, R.I.P., But I started that in February of 2016, and I kind of slid into a role there covering the Republican presidential primary. I hadn't covered Trump at all, you know, prior to that. But, you know, of course, he kind of consolidated his win that spring and into the summer. And so I found myself watching a lot of his speeches, interviews, you know, just to write stuff for the site. And then that fall, we had a training in our newsroom on Snapstream. It's a service that basically records cable TV and then, you know, creates a database that you can tap into to clip and post. And so we had this training and I I didn't really think much of it. But one night I happened to be home watching Fox, just kind of having it on in the background. And then Chief of Staff John Kelly was on Laura Ingram's show. And people might remember this interview because it generated a lot of waves at the time because This was shortly after the Charlottesville stuff, and Kelly was basically defending the honor of Confederate generals and saying, you know, they thought they were fighting for a good cause and he didn't think it was really about slavery and stuff like that. And so, you know, this interview kind of, 
I saw this as it was happening and, you know, kind of had that thought of, well, I just had this training on a video service. I should, you know, maybe put that to use and clip and post this and just kind of see how it does. And I think that might have been the first video, you know, that I ever posted in terms of like original clipping, uh, something that I had seen on TV and then clipped and posted. And it ended up being the most viral thing that I had ever posted at the time. And so right away, it kind of opened my eyes to the appetite that people have for news clips, kind of like news highlights. Of course, in that era of the Trump years, there was so much news on Fox because, you know, Trump was on Fox and Friends all the time. I just started kind of incorporating that into my workflow. I was an editor at Think Progress, but part of my job there was kind of like news blogger as well. And so from there, that was the fall of 2017. I kind of had, you know, exponential growth on my Twitter account in terms of followers, you know, right through the end of the the Trump era. And so, you know, it was never anything that I kind of like set out to do, but It was just kind of right place, right time. And, you know, my techniques in terms of watching stuff has evolved over the years. And these days I have a little bit less time than I used to have having a kid. I feel like I've kind of been eclipsed by like ASIN, for instance, I think is doing ASIN is watching way more Fox these days than I am. So I kind of dip in and out of it. But, you know, I still try to kind of keep my finger on the pulse and have a sense of what's going on in right wing media while also keeping an eye on CNN and MSNBC as well. But I feel like I kind of have a skill for like decoding and explaining Fox to a mostly progressive audience. And so I still view that as a key part of, of my job. So for anybody listening, I do really recommend you subscribe to his Substack public notice. I work in DC and this is one of the must read, but also must follow Twitter accounts. Uh, he definitely does have an interesting way of clipping things and explaining them. And it is actually very important and it is a great service that he provides for free. So definitely subscribe to his Substack uh, so that you can then uh, pay for that service from his writing angle. But Aaron, you're a prolific tweeter. You have a ton of followers. I know that I tweet into the void sometimes and I regret it, so I immediately delete it. I don't think that you could do that with getting away with it. But that leads me to my question. What is the worst tweet you've ever made or what is the tweet that you sent that you regretted the most and why? Okay, well, the one that comes to mind right away was... This is probably not the worst one ever posted, but it's one that comes to mind right away was when during the presidential transition period after the 2020 election, if I'm recalling the details correctly, it had kind of leaked that Biden was going to nominate Blinken to be his secretary of state. I'm trying to remember the exact I use like very there was a lot of reporting. You might remember this about Blinken having some involvement in like an Israeli AI company. And, there, you know, there were some questions about like conflicts of interest that he had based on private sector work that he had done after he had left, you know, after Obama had left office because he was working in the administration, the Obama administration. And I said something to the effect of like, uh, you know, it was kind of my sense that some of the concerns were a little bit trumped up, even though they were legitimate. But I posted a tweet that came very much across as dismissing them, where I said something about like, how dare he participate in society or something like that. And there are people, especially in the left, who thought that this was like pretty dismissive, which I agree was, you know, kind of a bad look to, especially after all that we endured with the Trump era and, you know, conflicts of interest being a big problem to sort of hand wave. And that was kind of what I was trying to get at was this seemed like pretty small peanuts compared to what we had just lived through. But that was one that I ended up basically just having to take an L. Sometimes that happens. I mean, you know, there's kind of this thing in this Twitter world that we live in where um, you're able to post your thoughts um, without any filter, without any editing. And I don't think I'm by any means, you know, like a worst offender when it comes to reckless tweeting or like tweeting things that that you regret. But, you know, like you were saying, when you have a large audience on Twitter, it kind of behooves you to always think twice about what you're tweeting just to make sure that it's not, you know, callous or dismissive, things like that. And that was one instance where it was, you know, I posted and then it was getting attention for the wrong reasons, like right away. But I also think when you do something like that, it's important to kind of be accountable and explain where you went wrong. You know, if you have to delete something with incorrect information, acknowledge that you did that and explain why. So I try to be as transparent as one can be. Well, you're clearly not a politician because you actually gave us an answer that was well thought out and explained. So (laughs) we do appreciate that. Another thing, though, I watch your clips or anybody's clips. And sometimes it'll be like a two minute clip and it will be somebody saying something ridiculous. And then I start thinking and I'm really like on the edge of my seat watching this short video 
wondering what the heck was said before or what the heck was said after in response to this ridiculous comment. So how do you go about clipping things and maintaining a context or how do you even go about deciding what the context is to give the people that you're clipping? It's definitely more of an art than a science. You know, I do think that um, especially these days, you know, when I see right wing accounts, there was an example a few weeks ago where there was a clip that was making the rounds from the RNC research account from a Biden speech. I'm trying to remember the specific context, but they had basically clipped like a three second. Like the clip was literally like three or four seconds of a Biden speech that they were using to attack Biden. And as a rule of thumb, the reason I mention that is because when some like the shorter that a clip is, usually that kind of suggest that there's some sort of sleight of hand going on where it, it depends on, you know, what the specific clip is. If it's, you know, a very brief moment, that can be one thing. But if it's like a sentence fragment, that that's another thing. So, you know, as a general rule, the longer that a clip is, the less likely that people are to watch the whole thing. So that's kind of the fine line. Like, you know, I get a lot of feedback from people sometimes where it's like, you know, why didn't you post like this whole five minute thing? Well, first of all, Twitter only allows for two minutes and 20 seconds of video in any one clip. And so there is kind of a fine line where you never want to decontextualize something and kind of be misleading in that way. But also, if everything you post is two minutes and 20 seconds long, people aren't going to watch all that. So you know, you kind of have to just make an editorial judgment like anything else when you're a journalist in terms of what is a complete thought here. Um, you know, am I representing this in its proper context and not misleading people? And, you know, I don't think anybody who posts video in the volume that I do is perfect on that. But, you know, I wish that there was kind of like a, you know, a science to it, but it's really not that. It, it's just an editorial call like a lot of other things in journalism. So, you know, I just try and be responsible because you never want that sort of attention with anything that you post. If, you know, if it's getting attention because people are accusing you of being misleading or deceptive, you know, that might be kind of like a sugar high, but that's going to kind of ruin your reputation in a way that's going to really damage you in the medium and long term. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson. Tonight, one upside of the very sad war in Ukraine is the national conversation underway in this country about freedom and democracy. Those are words on everyone's lips. And so it set us off on a nationwide search for Americans who are living as if this were a free country, like it was, say, 1989. And one of the first people we found, we have to tell you, is Kid Rock. We spent the weekend with him. We've got an interview with him in just a moment. Yeah, and you mentioned RNC research in 2016. That was a department I worked for I've since switched parties, as everybody listening knows. But the rule of thumb was, and this shows you how far the RNC has fallen under Trump's kind of grifty grasp, so to speak, was you were never allowed to take anything out of context. And even back then, I think, I don't want to say never, but it was general practice. You didn't take somebody's like just stammer or misstatement. And then the last thing is they used to primarily clip for CNN and MSNBC. And nowadays you just see them clipping Fox News clips, which is, is crazy and shows you how much it's evolved. Let me just throw in, because I, I looked this up as you were talking, the RNC research clip, this was in late January. And it was when Biden, it was when uh, Justice Breyer announced his retirement. And Biden did a press event with him in the White House. And Biden, his whole quote was, I'm not going to take any questions because I think it's inappropriate to take questions with the justice here. He's still sitting on the bench. And the RNC research account clipped that. So the whole clip that they posted was, I'm not going to take any questions because I think it's inappropriate. Kind of making it sound like Biden was dodging reporters. And so I posted this, you know, just like, look, this is completely misleading. Like, here's the whole clip. And they blocked me. So that was the... uh I can no longer see, you know, I have to like pull it up in a private window, you know, because I see people sometimes circulating their clips. 
But anyway, so just to, to add a little meat on the bone of that particular example. You aren't missing much, sir. Um, but over <laughs> to John. Uh, okay, so let's kind of move to the second part of this conversation, which is going to be about Fox News and analyzing their programming. Aaron, I know that you mentioned that you've been able to kind of back off a little bit of your consumption of Fox, but in the last few years, can you tell us like how many hours a day do you think that you were watching Fox News? When I'm working, I pretty much always have it on with the sound off, but I'm monitoring cable news all day. So I have CNN, MSNBC, you know, I have them all open in a window and I have an eye on them. So what I got pretty good at doing during the Trump years was whenever I saw a guest, you know, whether it was a member of Congress or one of the Trump kids on Fox, I would then, you know, pull up the audio and start listening in. And so I still kind of do that to this day across all of the different cable networks. So if you count that as watching Fox, I'm probably watching Fox, you know, somewhere between like four to six hours a day, I would say. The thing I've really kind of had to back off on is just doing it in the evenings. You know, there were times, um, and I still kind of do this when there's big news events, but, you know, there were times where I'd basically be watching the whole Fox primetime lineup right from, you know, Tucker Carlson through Hannity and then on to Laura Ingram. And now these days, I don't do that as much. I just have other stuff going on in the evenings all the time. And that's kind of where Asen comes in. I think he does a great job, like, really watching Fox every night reliably. And I know Media Matters does a lot of that, too. But, you know, in terms of actually listening to what Fox hosts are saying, that's probably more on the magnitude of, like, one to two hours a day. So it's not anything too crazy, but I've kind of gotten in that habit, you know, and this goes back five, five or so years now, of always having cable news kind of on in the background just in case. You know, because I can also alert alert you to major news developments um, in general, um, you know, as Twitter does as well. But, you know, especially with like the, the war that we're, you know, the war that's taking place right now, right now in Ukraine, you know, there's a lot of compelling images from that. But, yeah, so that's, it's just part of my workflow these days. You know, I'm not kind of sitting there in front of a TV watching Fox, but I sort of have, you know, a sense of when I need to kind of tune in if there's big news happening and when it's OK to sort of ignore it. So one of the reasons that media is so powerful is because it has the ability to shape people's perceptions and change their minds. And so there's commonly held the the belief or concern about various news networks, media networks, that they're going to change people's points of view, maybe in a misleading way or a way that you hope that they won't be. So you're watching Fox News more than almost anyone, more than most of their major audience members. So do you, when you're that immersed in their programming, do you ever find that some of their arguments are getting through to you, that they're becoming compelling or persuasive? Maybe not about the biggest things. Maybe they're not going to convince you to vote for Trump. But uh, are there smaller arguments that you hear on there where you, you've heard it enough and, and you're hearing the best version of this argument so many times that it's kind of getting through to you and changing your mind a little bit? I, I wouldn't say that they ever really change my mind because I kind of, my default assumption is that almost everything on there has an agenda. Um, so it's never really kind of like good faith information. So, you know, that's kind of my, that's not to say that like everything on there is dismissible or doesn't have validity or they never cover important stories. You know, they've, they've done some good coverage, especially with this war in, in Ukraine. But like, I, I will say that some of their gaslighting, I think, is effective on me. And I even kind of had an example of this today where I posted a clip that kind of took off today of Tucker Carlson in, in November 2019 openly saying that he was rooting for Russia in their conflict with Ukraine. And he was deadpanning this. I mean, this was not kind of like a sarcastic remark. Like, you know, this was an expression of a truly held belief that he had that, you know, he preferred that Russia prevail in that conflict, you know, that dates back to 2014 now with Ukraine. And he had a statement uh, last night on his show, something to the effect of who would ever side with Russia? Like nobody would do that, you know, and kind of defending himself from accusations that he is pro Putin or at least anti anti Putin. And, you know, I kind of had this vague recollection of him saying something like that, that thing that I mentioned in November 2019, but I had to kind of go back and pull it up and, you know, there it was. And, you know, it was just kind of a reminder of, wow, you know, I mean, he was kind of taking maximalist positions back then in terms of this Russia Ukraine thing. And now he wants people to forget it. And so, in that sense, sometimes, you know, kind of the way that the goalposts can move, I can sort of forget forget where they used to be or that form of gaslighting, trying to get people forget things that you have said, you know, on the air previously can be effective. I feel like people on Fox, their hosts especially, are kind of role playing a lot of the time. So I just never really approach anything that a host says 
from the standpoint of them, you know, I never assume that they're trying to share good faith information. I always kind of assume that it's furthering some sort of agenda. And so when you start with that assumption, you're pretty skeptical about about everything that you hear on there. And so that's how I kind of filter that, you know, that's how I filter Fox News. So I, I can't think of anything. I mean, I'll, I'll keep mulling on that. And if something comes to mind, I'll definitely share it with you. But I can't think of a time that Fox has kind of changed my sincerely held views on an issue. So speaking of gaslighting and speaking of pro Putin and pro Russia, I, I do want to get into Tucker Carlson. I believe there was a November clip of 2021 where he's speaking with Mike Turner, who uh, is in line to be the chairman of, I believe, the Intel Committee if the Republicans take back the House. And he asked Mike Turner, why shouldn't why should we be skeptical of Russia? And, and the congressman was like flabbergasted. He was blown away. Like, what are like, are you a fucking idiot? Pardon my language. Uh, so I was wondering for people who maybe don't know this side of Tucker Carlson, uh, before he started changing his tune, can you walk us through a little bit of why he was pro-Russia, if not why he was pro-Russia, what some of his pro-Russia and pro-Putin arguments were even? Yeah, so back in 2019, it seemed to be kind of pro-Russia for the sake of, at that point, he was trying to defend Trump during the early stages of the impeachment drama. You know, that was before the impeachment vote had taken place in the House, but I think it was kind of that reflexive, you know, all of the libs are ganging up on Trump over this Ukraine thing. And so he was kind of towing the line that, it, you know, there was no problem with the phone call and there was corruption in Ukraine and all of that stuff. I had actually forgotten about that Turner clip, which I think I had posted. Um, I'm looking at it right now. And that, you know, that was, like you said, November 2021. And You know, basically at that point, Carlson's argument was that, look, Russia has all these energy reserves. It's a much more powerful country than Ukraine. Why wouldn't we be on their side? You know, I mean, he just seemed totally oblivious and still does seem oblivious to the idea that the U.S. should side with democratic countries when they get into conflicts or are attacked in this case by an authoritarian country. He just seems to kind of lack that moral compass that I think we a lot of times as Americans take for granted or kind of expect out of public figures or elected officials that, you know, when there's any doubt, you give the benefit of the doubt to the democracy. And I think that's kind of part of Carlson's shtick. You know, of course, he's broadcast from Hungary um, in recent years. And so I just think that's kind of like a, you know, he's very skeptical, I think, of democracy. And I, I don't know if that's really been an evolution per se, but I think it's become, you know, to me as someone who, who, like you said, watches a lot of Fox, it's one thing to tune into Fox and see these hosts either supporting Trump or being anti-anti-Trump, as the case may be. But, I, you know, I found it to be a lot more jarring to tune in in recent weeks and see hosts like Tucker Carlson, especially, and I think he's by far the most clear example of this on the network, be anti-Putin. Because I wouldn't go as far as to say that Carlson is pro-Putin. Um, you know, he still makes sure to kind of throw in parenthetically that this invasion is bad and the violence in Ukraine is bad, but he always immediately pivots to, and, you know, but at the same time, our elected officials should be more concerned about the invasion across the southern border or about the drug crisis and things like that. So, you know, I wouldn't go as far as to say he's pro-Putin, but he's definitely anti-anti-Putin. And to me, you know, when we're kind of in this conflict that we're in, we're, you know, we're clearly siding with Ukraine. And there's a possibility now that, you know, there could be a hot war between NATO and Russia. And to see the most watched host on American TV kind of toe the Kremlin line, to me, is striking in a way that a lot of the the pro-Trump stuff never really was, because you just sort of expected that from Fox. But the fact that, you know, I think we're looking at a conflict here where the the moral dimension of it, to me, seems quite clear. And I don't know if that makes me like kind of a, you know, a simpleton or something, but, you know, you have this authoritarian country that for no good reason invaded its neighbor. And, you know, it it seems like we should be able to kind of speak with moral clarity about that. And so I, I, you know, I guess I'm not really surprised that that Carlson is kind of towing this line, but um, I will say, and I, I wrote about this extensively yesterday that some of the conspiracy theories that he's indulging towards this end of sort of trying to justify Putin's war effort or to insinuate that Putin had good reasons to be skeptical of Ukraine or to, you know, kind of tie the U.S. and the Biden administration to these alleged bioweapons labs in Ukraine, which don't actually even exist. You know, I think it's it's kind of shocking to me that he's going that far with some of it, because you think that this could maybe be 
an area where, yes, I mean, you can criticize certain aspects of Biden's handling of it. You can say Biden should have slapped sanctions on sooner, you know, should have tried to deter Putin before the fact more instead of kind of waiting for the invasion to happen to slap these sanctions on and to really wage economic warfare. And certainly I'm open to those sorts of arguments. But, you know, some of the conspiracy theories he's indulging that have very clear ties to Kremlin propaganda, it's just sort of dismaying to see this on a show that is the most watched show on, on cable news. So I don't know if it really represents an, re- represents an evolution on Carlson's behalf, but I think, you know, there's a, there's part of it that's kind of like contrarianism. I think there's part of it that is just one of his kind of deeply held beliefs is that, you know, democracies aren't that great. And so, you know, that's just kind of so, what it is with him. So, Aaron, could you tell us then how Tucker's programming on the Russia-Ukraine issue fits into the broader Fox News network? Is Tucker out on a limb a little bit compared to the rest of Fox News? Is he covering this issue in a way that's very different from the other programming on the channel? I would say that Tucker has done further than other hosts in trying to make excuses for Putin feeling threatened by Ukraine or having reasons why he thought invading was a good idea. I think Hannity, by contrast, you know, when I tune into his coverage in recent weeks, it's much more laser focused on attacking Biden, blaming him for higher energy prices, higher gas prices, that sort of thing, without straying as far down the path of pushing these insane, you know, bioweapons conspiracy theories that are meant to justify Putin feeling threatened by Ukraine or to somehow link the U.S., you know, to antagonizing Russia in some way. And I would say the daytime coverage is much more of kind of what you would expect. There's a lot of coverage, obviously, of energy prices, which are used as kind of a cudgel to attack Biden. And there's been a lot of talk about Biden's purported weakness, you know, sort of opening the door to Putin thinking this was a good idea. But I would definitely say that it's my sense that Carlson's kind of further out on that limb of parroting Russian propaganda slash Putin's rationale for invading, for instance, by, you know, last week, he had a segment that was basically devoted to this idea that Ukraine is not even really a country, that it's a creation of the U.S. State Department, which is exactly the sorts of things that Putin was saying to justify essentially declaring war and invading. And so that to me is where the difference is. You know, you can kind of quibble with editorial choices that Fox makes during the day to focus on certain aspects of it. But, you know, they do have reporters on the ground, and I don't mean to discount the work that they're doing. But Ian Carlson features some of those same reporters. But, you know, if you really watch the on the ground updates that appear on Carlson's show, they're much more tactical in nature, where it's kind of like, you know, Russia tonight, you know, is going to have its most intense bombardment yet of Kiev sort of thing. You know, there's not really a lot of focus on the humanitarian plight. And, you know, they kind of gloss over it in a way that I don't think other Fox shows do. So to, to me, that's the difference Aaron, with Carlson. About the people that Fox News have got on the ground in Ukraine, we should really acknowledge today that two people working for Fox News on the story were killed um, in, in the action in Ukraine. And that's uh, Pierre Zakruski and uh, Alexandra Kushinova. So two people, a man and a woman, uh, were, were killed in the action. So uh, before we talk any further about Fox News and their coverage, I just want to make sure that we mention that. And then um, I'm going to go over to Justin because I know Justin's got a, got a question here. Russia called a U.N. Security Council meeting today to renew its allegations that it says the U.S. might be somehow funding bioweapons in Ukraine. Now, here's what you need to know. Outside experts, the United States government and independent press fact checks have rejected that claim. So absent further evidence... Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. If you had told us just four days ago that the Biden administration was funding secret bio labs in Ukraine, of all places, we would not have believed you. Yeah, I don't think we're going to put that on TV. No, thanks. Then if you told us that not only did the administration fund these secret bio labs in Ukraine, but that they then failed to secure the deadly contents of those labs before the Russian invasion, an invasion they knew was coming, an invasion they helped encourage, If you had told us that four days ago, we would have dismissed you as a nut. It was just too preposterous. We would not want anything to do with a story like that. There was no way it could be true. It's too far out. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Yeah, Aaron, I was just wondering, you mentioned the biolabs issue twice. 
Can you kind of walk us through what this theory is? I think you said it wasn't true and then why it might be dangerous. Yeah. So just to give you kind of the, the quick and dirty on this, um, because it is a very complicated subject, but for the last 15 years or so, the U.S. has been involved financially with Ukrainian labs that basically aim to deter the development of biological weapons. Some of this has to do with the Soviet Union dissolving and there being nuclear and biological materials on, you know, in Ukrainian territory. And some of it has to do with public health research. You know, and there's labs like this all over the world. It's not a secret um, that receive funding from the U.S. and that, you know, U.S. researchers are involved with. But Carlson the origins of this are quite complicated, and I, I refer people, Ben Collins at, from NBC had a, a piece yesterday that kind of traced this from the fringes of right-wing social media to Carlson's show over the past couple weeks or so, because, you know, as many stories of this sort have, you know, the, its origins are kind of obscure in the, in the fringes of social media, but, you know, as it was amplified by larger and larger platforms, it made its way quite quickly onto Carlson's show. And so Carlson is basically conflating these biolabs, which do kind of normal public health research. They do, you know, nothing that you, you don't have to take the U.S. government's word for this. They're also public health experts that aren't affiliated with the U.S. government that have kind of confirmed that there is no, you know, biological there's there's no development of biological weapons happening on Ukrainian territory. But Carlson ended up uh, misrepresenting an interview that a Pentagon official gave to the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, where he expressed concern, as anyone would, that one of these biolabs would be shelled or bombed. And, you know, they do research on viruses there. And so there is the possibility that if one of these laboratories was bombed, that it could create a public health crisis in the region. And that's not, you know, a big secret. That's something that informed people have been talking about for months now. And that somehow turned into, and there was really never any there there with this. There was no merit to it, but these concerns that the U.S. was involved in funding bioweapons research in Ukraine and that this was antagonizing Russia. And you, he had Glenn Greenwald on last Thursday to say the only explanation for this is that the U.S. is trying to provoke Russia in some way by doing this this research on Ukrainian territory you know, and this isn't a new thing. This is a conspiracy theory that's been pushed by the Kremlin for years now to justify, you know, their hostility towards Ukraine. But then that turned into just last night, Tucker posted a tweet on his, you know, he doesn't tweet that often, but on his Twitter account, totally moving the goalposts and saying, well, now even the U.S. government admits that there are biolabs on Ukrainian territory. But he spent all of last week talking about bioweapons. And so, you know, it, it was a very clear example to me of how the goalposts kind of move. And, you know, because he lives in this kind of hermetically sealed information universe on his show where, you know, his claims about this were debunked by a range of outlets. Both the, the New York Times and Washington Post had stories last Friday debunking his claims about bioweapons. But he just moved the goalposts, you know, from bioweapons to biolabs and is just carrying on like it's the same thing when it's not. And so I think that's part of the way in which he sort of in insults the intelligence of his own viewers, where I think because it's kind of a complicated subject, it's sort of an ideal one to just lie to people about and trust that they're not going to actually look into this on their own. But the core idea to me, at least, I mean, there, there are kind of a couple things. One is that it seemed to sort of provide some sort of rationale for why Putin may have felt threatened by Ukraine, number one. But then number two, by kind of shifting the terrain from Russia invading Ukraine into this weird controversy about the U.S. being involved in the funding of biolabs in, in Ukraine, you know, it gave him kind of a pretext to change the story into one where he can attack the Dr. Fauci's of the world and sort of discredit, you know, public health officials and, you know, Biden administration officials. And so to me, it kind of represented, you know, instead of him feeling comfortable just kind of covering the story as it happens in Ukraine, you know, everything has to be in kind of this universe of us versus them and, you know, the deep state. And, you know, and so to me, it was just, an, you know, I, I interpret it as an attempt that he was making to, to kind of reposition the, the story of Russia's war on Ukraine into terrain that's more comfortable for him and that makes for more compelling adversarial TV but, you know, the whole, like I said, the, this whole thing about bioweapons seemed to basically be Tucker misconstruing quotes from a Pentagon official in the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists and just kind of trusting that his viewers wouldn't actually 
do the research on their own to figure out that he was basically lying to them. And it's all conspiratorial or or Tucker lying to them. And as you know, the real danger is that it could give Russia pretext for a false flag where they then use bioweapons and point to these non-existent bioweapons labs that people freaks really like Tucker Carlson and Glenn, Glenn Greenwald are going on Fox News and, and lying about. So I, I did want to ask one last question. We're running a little long, so we'll try and keep you for five extra minutes or so, depending on if you have a hard out for the audience. On Tucker's show, you mentioned Glenn Greenwald, who I think people know what he is if if they know how to consume information. Does Tucker Carlson have other guests on, though? So not only the ones parroting the lies and crazy conspiracy theories like Glenn Greenwald, but ones like Jennifer Griffin, who present the strongest argument of the other side, or he just, what does he do? Does he not have them on or or how does he approach that? I feel like he used to more, you know, he he used to, that used to be kind of part of the show is that he would have uh, liberals on there to kind of argue with him. And I feel like he hasn't done that as much. I mean, maybe the best example of something like that recently was the the clip that you mentioned earlier when Mike Turner went on there. And if people haven't seen that, you know, if, if you search Mike Turner under my Twitter account, you'll find the clips. But, you know, that that kind of turned into a pretty spirited back and forth where this Republican congressman, you know, who's a Mike Turner is a fan of Trump. I mean, he's not like a Mitt Romney or Liz Cheney, but, you know, he was on there kind of articulating sort of a standard U.S. foreign policy line that, you know, of course, we should be on Ukraine's side. You know, Russia's the aggressor here. They're an authoritarian country that's kind of coming up with weird pretexts to have a military build up. And, you know, of course, we're on Ukraine's side. And Tucker was really pushing back on that. But, there's been some interesting stuff surrounding Jen Griffin on Hannity's show where, you know, she went on there once a couple of weeks ago and debunked a couple of false claims that he had made earlier in the show about the situation in Ukraine. And then after that, he would still have her on the show, but he would have her on like right away, like within the first three minutes of the show. So she wasn't able to have her on in a situation where she couldn't really debunk things that he would say later. So that seemed to be kind of a notable editorial shift. But Tucker doesn't really have her on. He will have on like Trey Yinks, who's one of the Fox News reporters who's in Ukraine. But again, it's for very kind of matter of fact news updates. You know, he's not really asking them to provide any sort of commentary and they don't really engage in any sort of back and forth that would provide opportunity for pushback. And, you know, as close as he comes to having, you know, dissenting voices would be like a Tulsi Gabbard or a Glenn Greenwald, because, you know, people still think of them in some, you know, at least some people kind of think of them as not being conservatives. And of course, people probably saw that Philip Bump of The Washington Post did a a post last week where he described Glenn as a right wing pundit. And uh, Glenn had quite a memorable meltdown. You know, there was like a a multi tweet, you know, explosion on Philip Bump for describing him as a right wing pundit, you know, in the the Washington Post. I mean, you used to have Representative Rokana on during the Trump years, but I have not noticed that as much lately. That's actually I hadn't really thought about that, but it seems like he mainly has people on these days that agree with him. My friend at Media Matters, Andrew Lawrence, roasted Ro Khanna for going on the show, and Ro has not gone on it since. So uh, we will go over to Mr. Gunnison. Yeah, I actually, Ro and I used to, like, Ro and I used to DM, and I kind of felt like he was my, my friend. And then at one point, I did criticize him for going on Fox, and he ended up unfollowing me. We kind of, like, severed ties on social media over that. And, you know, that was when, actually, I did have some kind of second thoughts on that, because, you know, Ro would never... It's not like Roe would go on Fox News like Pete Buttigieg used to and really kind of like come ready to push back, you know, and like kind of debunk spin and misinformation on there. I mean, Roe would go on there for more kind of, I don't know if friendly is the right term, but at least like amicable type interviews. But Roe's point was that, you know, it's, it's important to kind of reach out to people who don't agree with you. And I don't think that's inherently wrong. But I myself, you know, if I ever received an invitation to go on Tucker's show or, or Sean Hannity's show, I would not do it because you're basically being used as a prop. So, you know, it, it kind of varies. And I think there's no like one right answer to that. But yeah, you know, Ro, I haven't seen him on Fox in a while now. I was just going to say, yeah, I wonder how much of it is just that they're struggling to get bookings on Tucker show from that perspective, because like you acknowledge, people like Ro Khanna can go on and try to find common cause on the economic matters where Tucker is sort of drifted leftward. But on this issue of Russia and Ukraine, Tucker's show is just so toxic that it must be so difficult really to get a credible person on the program. But we're going to go to the audience now. We're going to go first to Peter Chow. And after Peter, we are going to go to Martin. So over to Peter first. Thanks so much, Aaron, for joining. Um, my question's on this article 
by Nate Persley, who's a professor at Stanford. Not saying you have to have heard of it, but it's called The Internet's Threat to Democracy. And he points to different aspects of the Internet, mainly velocity, like the speed of information, virality, you know, the viral spread and anonymity. And I'm sure that you can realize these aspects in, in, in utilizing them to, to get your message across. And I'm wondering, how do you think about the, the medium of the message that you're trying to communicate and the broader, the, the medium that we're using for journalism nowadays and how it affects uh, your listeners and how we should just think of the media landscape given the, the medium of the Internet? And is it really a challenge to democracy? Yeah, that's a great question. I do think that Twitter has sort of gamified political discourse in a way that I think is kind of problematic, where there's, you know, again, there's kind of this incentive to saying something provocative that will get attention and kind of gain you followers or likes or retweets, whatever the case may be. And, you know, especially when you're kind of doing that under the guise of anonymity where you don't really have that same sort of skin in the game and you can kind of be very provocative and not really receive any consequences for it. You know, yeah, I mean, I I do think that that is problematic. I sometimes kind of think about, though, that there might have been incentives similar to that in previous eras, you know, whether, you know, if you were a newspaper columnist circulation numbers or, you know, how many uh, letters you receive in a newsroom responding to things that you write. So I I don't know if it's ever been like totally different, but I think that the way that social media works, it's right in front of us all the time. And we kind of have all this information in real time. And, you know, this has been something that, you know, and this is no discredit to my former colleague, Matt Iglesias, who I, I do think does some really thoughtful and good work, but some people might remember this. He had, he had a tweet, um, where, I believe it was in reference to something he wrote on the lab leak theory, where he basically kind of prefaced his tweet that was sharing a story that he wrote saying, like, I found that this sort of stuff is really good for readership, you know, and it was kind of giving away the game where it's like, well, you know, you really shouldn't be making editorial choices based on what resonates with readers and what drives in more subscribers and things like that. And, you know, there's, I, I do have some cognitive dissonance some, sometimes with that being on Substack because, you know, obviously Substack is kind of known for contrarianism, for, you know, people like Eric, uh, Alex Berenson who are kind of um, spreading misinformation. And there's, you know, it creates kind of perverse incentives in some ways where if you, you know, say something really provocative, it brings more attention, it brings more subscribers, it brings more money. And so, I try to be resistant to that and kind of do my thing as I know that I should and have integrity and kind of cover things that I think are important, regardless of whether or not they will bring in more subscribers. But, you know, Substack is kind of a little bit of a a separate thing, I think, because, yeah, I mean, I think Twitter has created some, you know, some weird incentives in that way. For me, because my name and, you know, identity is attached to everything, you know, your reputation is on the line all the time. So, and when you're working in journalism, that's a really important thing to kind of preserve and protect and try and maintain. But, yeah, I mean, I do think there is something problematic about how social media has kind of gamified our political discourse. I don't pretend to have any, like, great answers to it. But, you know, it's just something that I try to be aware of as I make judgments on what to post on what to write, what to cover, all that sort of stuff. Thank you very much, Peter. We will go to Martin and then we will go to Aram. Martin, over to you. Two part question. The first part is, what do you think has led to the success for Harris Faulkner? Uh, she's the only black woman that I know of that has a uh, daily uh, cable show on any cable news channel. And she's on Fox. She's one of the uh, few black journalists on a daily news show, anchoring her own show, that is. And then lastly, what's your take on where Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas wife has landed in in mainstream media is definitely on the side of maybe putting our hands on a thumb of scales of justice. But I haven't seen anything from Fox about that. Yeah, thank you. That, those are both really interesting questions. I mean, with, with Harris Faulkner, that's really interesting because I guess I've never really, you're totally right that I think she's the only like regular black host on Fox. They do have some people that occasionally will fill in, but yeah, in terms of like being on TV every day, I mean, she's very good on TV, no doubt. I mean, and, and actually she worked for a time in the Twin Cities market with, I believe it was KSTP television here. So 
she does kind of have like she's known in in Twin Cities journalism circles as being like a local TV anchor before she made her way to Fox. I, I you know I I don't think it's anything especially racial with her. I just think that she to me she's kind of in the same sort of realm as like an Ainsley Earhart. She, I find Laura Ingram to be especially insufferable because she's so smug, and Harris Faulkner doesn't have that same smugness to her. So beyond that, though, I've never really – like, I, I couldn't explain her success in, in any sort of, like, racialized terms. I just kind of view her as being, you know, like another Fox host. But, you know, you are right that, that she is, you know, one of – I think she's the only um, black host on a regular basis on Fox. So so that is notable. And with regard to – Clarence Thomas's wife. I mean, I, I do think that um, her views as kind of fringe as they are. And, you know, I saw some reporting this week that I didn't dive deeply into that. Now she's saying she was at January 6th, but ended up going home because she was cold or something like that. You know, there's no end to these stories. I mean, I know she's very active in like fringe right wing Facebook groups and things like that. And I do think that kind of speaks to Justice Thomas's political convictions in a way that is pretty unflattering for him. But I think there's always kind of, you know, a, hesit- a hesitance to a- attack the spouse of a public figure or to read too much into, you know, to ascribe her views to him sort of thing. I think there's a lot of evidence that they have pretty consistent views. But I think in terms of like a lack of coverage of them, you know, I, I don't think the media has always been consistent with this. But, I- you know, I do think that spouses, family members are kind of viewed as being, private figures in a way that if you're a Supreme Court justice or an elected official, you know, you're more of a public figure. And so things that you say and do are are totally fair game. But if you're someone's spouse, maybe it's not quite the same. So, um, you know, I do think all indications are that she's way out there on the fringe of the right wing and that, you know, that probably speaks to Justice Thomas's politics as well. But, you know, it can be kind of a dicey line to draw or, you know, if, if you went too hard on it, you, you would kind of be seen as attacking a private citizen. And, you know, that, that can be a bad look. Fox hasn't done anything on her positive. I don't think so. I, I, you know, I can't think of a time that she's ever really even come up on Fox. That's one of the things with Fox that people sometimes can overlook if you don't watch a lot is that actually, you know, Republicans are talked about very little on Fox usually. I mean, it's all about kind of finding something to either get angry or performatively angry towards Democrats or liberals about. I mean, that was true even during the Trump years. You know, you had all the stuff that you could talk about that Trump was doing and saying. And most of the time it was about, you know, some AOC tweets or Maxine Waters. And that's kind of how Fox does business. I mean, it's very rarely kind of like delving into what's going on on the, on the right. You know, they just prefer to ignore that these days. So, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see that sort of a segment on MSNBC, which, you know, does more coverage of that sort. But um, Fox is very myopically focused most of the time on the libs because owning them makes for good television. Aaron, I was wondering if you could give us your strongest critique against the more liberal shows like CNN and MSNBC, what do they do really wrong that is potentially dangerous? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to kind of like that level of generalization. I mean, you know, again, like I think a guy like Jake Tapper does really good work at times. But I will say that, like, I've definitely noticed recently with Tapper that he'll go really, really hard on Democrats because I think that kind of builds his credibility in the sense that, you know, I'm people perceive him as being liberal, but it's like, you know, I'm really holding these Democrats to account. I'm going to ask them tough questions. And then he had Bill Barr on there just a couple of days ago, you know, Bill Barr doing his book tour, kind of rehab, image rehab tour. And it was just a remarkably kind of weak interview, you know, where he was kind of just, in the, you know, Barr said a couple of things that were just like completely absurd that Tapper, and I posted clips of this on Twitter. One, Barr said that he views the left as being a totalitarian threat to the country, you know, and Tapper just kind of let that go. And there were, there were, there was one more, you know, there, there were a couple of times where Tapper just did not push back on things that Barr was saying. And so that to me, I don't know if that's really like satisfying along the lines of what you were asking, but I think there is a, you know, both on MSNBC and on CNN, these hosts want to be viewed as being kind of above the fray of partisan politics. And so they want to be very hard and ask very tough questions of Democrats, but they don't always hold Republicans to that same standard because I think there's kind of the sense that, you know, it's really nice to have a Republican on your show. It kind of builds that bipartisan cred. So, but, you know, cable news in general, you know, if you're getting like, you know, I'm a very avid reader of news and books and like, 
I think if you were getting your information primarily from cable news, you would be a pretty stunted person because you can't really go into detail on any of these stories. I mean, it's like a five minute segment on, you know, some major world development. It's really hard to get to drill down into any level of nuance or to have any, you know, appropriate historical context for things. It's an Axios story at best with the bullet points, right? Right. Absolutely. And so, you know, to me, that's just kind of a shortcoming of the medium. And, you know, I went from writing for an alt weekly publication in Minneapolis to working for a local TV station. And that was really kind of a jarring. This was many years ago now, but it was jarring to move over to, to TV news where it was like, man, you know, to, to cram all this information into like a two or three minute story and still make it entertaining is really difficult. Like, you know, like the, these Robert Carroll books that I was referring to earlier, like they're so richly detailed with reporting and interviews and history and all. And, and you just can't really get that across unless you're doing like a 10 hour documentary on something. And so, you know, th th this isn't meant as kind of shade at, at cable anchors, because I think, you know, many of them do their jobs very well. But um, that's when, you know, again, and, and not to beat up on Jake Tapper, but to me, you know, he'll have uh, Jen Psaki on his show, which he did a few months ago. And he actually ended up like kind of throwing in a disclaimer at the end. Like, I know it's very hard on her, but we hold people accountable here. And then you have Bill Barr on. And it's like he's just kind of happy to have a Republican on his show. And so. You know, that to me, I, I just wish that there was kind of a consistent standard across the board. Marshall, over to you. Uh, thank you for being here. I just had a quick question. I was curious what you thought of Chris Wallace. Yeah, so I was probably more of a fan of Wallace than most progressives because his show, and I've, I've tweeted this much, you know, when he left that um, I thought it was really kind of a big loss for Fox because he at least was a voice on Fox that I thought had some degree of integrity. I always thought that when he kind of veered into punditry, that was when I kind of had to turn him off, you know, because a lot of the times it was kind of the standard right wing talking points. But he would have Republicans on his show and ask very tough kind of probing questions about their past votes. You know, I mean, he would be the type of person that these days would be having Republicans on his show to ask them about how they could stand by Trump during the first impeachment and now criticize Biden for not doing enough to arm Ukraine. You know, it's kind of basic questions that are informed by history that, you know, are just kind of good accountability journalism. And so, you know, Fox News Sunday has really fallen off since he has left because it's basically now just kind of a rotating cast of people that you see on Fox every day who are just doing kind of like basic Fox News interviews, um, m mostly with Republicans. And so, you know, they're not very interesting. It's what you can see on Fox basically any day of the week. So, you know, we'll see what happens on CNN with his show. But to me, I thought his voice was a lot more valuable being kind of like the, you know, sort of a different type of voice on Fox rather than being just kind of like another another person on CNN. Because one of his superpowers on Fox was that he could book a Rick Scott or a Ted Cruz or Marco Rubio and ask them tough questions because they would go on because of the Fox News brand. And you'll never see Ted Cruz or Rick Scott on CNN, um, or at least these days you wouldn't. So, you know, I'm not sure who he's going to really get to go on a show. If he ends up kind of being able to run it back in terms of getting those same types of guests on the show, I think that could be kind of a valuable addition to the CNN family. But if it just turns into another Jake Tapper show, you know, I, I don't I think he was he was serving a more valuable function at Fox doing that than he than he will be at CNN. And in general, I'm kind of skeptical of this whole CNN plus streaming thing. I, I just don't know how many people are really going to be willing to pay for that. But time will tell. I know. I, I think his show is debuting pretty soon, right? So, yeah, the proof will be in the pudding there. But, I mean, I'm an avid news watcher, and I'm not going to watch any of these shit on these streaming services. <laughs> Pardon no, my no I, and I don't really plan to either. And, and that could change. I mean, if they end up getting a lot of really, you know, high-profile guests and there's a lot of news – I'll be willing to pay for it. But, you know, we're just so saturated with that sort of thing right now anyway that I don't feel a compelling need to, like, shell out even more money to to pay attention to that, too. But, you know, again, if it ends up being a source of news, then, yeah, then I'll happily pay for it. That's all we have for you today. Again, huge thanks to Aaron, to our audience for their questions, and to you for being here. As a reminder, like all of our episodes, this is an edited version of a much longer conversation that was taped live with audience questions. For information on how to join us in past episodes, please visit our website, pm101.live. Please also take a second to subscribe on whichever podcast streaming service you're using right now so you don't miss our next episode this Friday, featuring Justin Chang, who's a film critic for the LA Times and NPR's Fresh Air. 
This has been Politics Media 101, produced in partnership with Clubhouse. I'm Jeff Browning. On behalf of Justin Higgins, our co-founder and our team, thank you very much for being here. We hope to see you and hear from you soon.